We're starting a new series this morning, Codes of the Kingdom, and we're going to be talking through some of the parables of Jesus. You remember uh, his preferred teaching style, and I think one of the reasons why people were drawn to him was he told stories, he told these parables. It's one of the reasons, I think, among many, that Jesus was perhaps the least boring person to ever live. I mean, no one ever met Jesus or encountered Jesus and walked away thinking, meh, I don't know, no big deal. I mean, you either loved him or you loathed him. Uh, Jesus either got in your grill and confronted you or he, he comforted you. Jesus was anything but boring. And the parables that he told are part of the reason, I think, that he engaged people in, in so many different ways. Uh, and they are essentially ways that he communicates about the kingdom of God. They are codes of the kingdom. The parables of Jesus, this is just kind of an introductory thing. Bear with me for just two minutes here. The, co- uh, the, the parables operate on, on two different levels, okay? Um, in one sense, at, like first glance, you're going to see the parables, and Jesus is talking about very familiar things. He's talking about work. He's talking about salary. He's talking about parties. He's talking about a lost sheep or a lost coin or a lost son. He's talking about just everyday sorts of things Uh, But at another level, at a deeper level, he is kind of pulling back the curtain and letting us peek in and see what the kingdom of God is really like. So you've got the clear level and you've got the coded level. You've got the everyday level and you've got the eternal level. Those are the two ways that parables kind of operate. Um, I want you to listen to what one of his disciples, Matthew, said about the teaching style of Jesus. This is from Matthew chapter 13. Uh, Matthew wrote, All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. So always telling stories. This was to fulfill what was written by the prophet, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. So he's going to let us in on some things that a lot of people don't see. A lot of things that that are hidden to most of the world. Through the parables, if we listen, he's going to let us in on some things. And I love a good story. Most people I know love a good story. I love to read novels. I love to watch movies. In fact, they don't even have to be, you know, Academy Award caliber. It doesn't even have to be that good to hold my attention. I love stories. And I think, like I said, that's one of the reasons Jesus was not boring. He held people's attention. All right. Um, So here we go. When people met Jesus, they had all of these kinds of reactions. And I think you'll see Uh, in this one parable that we're going to look at this morning. Why? And I want you just to kind of turn on your imagination, all right? Uh, Just kind of imagine this playing out with me. It may be familiar or very unfamiliar to you, but here you are in Dallas, Texas, um, but you haven't had a regular job in a while. Frankly, you're not even month to month. You're kind of week to week, even sometimes day to day, as to how you're going to put food on the table, how you're going to pay the bills. On this particular Monday morning, you do what you've been doing for some time. You get dressed, you put on your work boots, your blue jeans, and a t-shirt, and you head off to an intersection over in Garland. And at this intersection, each morning, lots of guys just like you who are out of work gather looking for day labor sorts of jobs. You know, you might get 30, 40 bucks a day doing who knows what for someone who drives up in a pickup or a flatbed and loads a bunch of yawn and says, hey, I need help with this or that project. That's what you've been doing for some time. By the time you get there on this Monday morning, there are already several fellows gathered. All right. Um, There are no resumes and usually no job interviews involved in these projects. Just a guy... Uh, pointing out of the window of his truck at different people, and they hop on, and off they go to the work site. So, on this day, a guy pulls up in a big flatbed truck, points to you and to several others. You guys get on the back of the truck, and off you go uh, toward the job. 
What he's going to have you do, he explains, once you get there, is you're going to be doing roofing on several houses that have been hail damaged. The houses are right there together. At the end of the day, he promises you will each be paid 40 bucks, which is pretty good. You're pretty happy about that. Uh, also, you have roofed houses before, so no big deal. You know what you're doing. And the morning isn't bad. I mean, the air is still relatively cool, so... Um, you're off to a good start. And a lot of the guys that you're working with, you have worked with before. You know these guys, so conversations are struck up, the banner's going, the rhythm of put, putting on the shingles uh, is, is going on, and things are good. But man, there's a lot of work to be done. So you are relieved or glad when just a few hours later that truck pulls back up and another crew gets off to help out. Uh, most of them have done roofing before, like your guys, uh, but a few need a quick tutorial, but they're working, and it's good because there is so much to be done. Sometime after lunch, now you're in the heat of the afternoon, the truck pulls up again. Once more, workers pile off, and there is a little sense of relief again that more help has arrived, but a lot of these guys don't really seem like they know what they're doing, so they're having to be taught. They're having to kind of do a tutorial uh, down on the ground before they get up and start roofing. Um, but anyway, here's the kicker. After you have already been on the job for nine hours, another crew shows up in that same flatbed. Um, and it's kind of weird because at this point, like the jobs are pretty much done. You're just kind of wrapping things up. All the heavy lifting has been done. Honestly, there's not a lot for this new crew to even do. So they just kind of occupy themselves for the final hour kind of looking busy because there's not a lot for them to do. You and the guys who have put in the hard work since the early morning, um, you don't really talk to these new guys. I mean, you don't know them, and they just got there. You guys have kind of built this camaraderie throughout the day, so you just kind of ignore them. No one is really sure even why the boss went out and pulled this last crew in. Then something happens that really just shocks you. The boss calls everyone over. It's the end of the day. And it's time to hand out the money. You get paid in cash. And he starts by paying the dudes who just got here. Right? The guys who just showed up. And you're thinking, that's not cool. I mean, you've been here all day. You should get paid. You should get on home to your family. Right? Um, you're ticked until you see how much he's paying them. He hands each one of them three $20 bills. 60 bucks, Right? Which is great. And you're kind of doing the math in your head. I mean, if they're getting paid 60 bucks for an hour, wow, you may get upwards of $700 for one day's work. Amazing stuff. You and your wife will finally be able to take uh, the honeymoon that you have been putting off for so long. Now the boss calls up the guys who showed up three hours ago. He hands them the same amount. Three crisp $20 bills for each one of them. Then he calls up the guys who showed up six hours ago. Same amount of money. They're getting paid the same as, as the other two groups. Finally, the boss calls you up. And even though you arrived with the earliest group, you are getting paid last. And to top it all off, he thanks you for your work and hands you the same 60 bucks he's been giving to all of the other crews that showed up. You're so angry, you just feel like slugging the guy, really. Like I said, and that's the story Jesus tells. And like I said, anything but boring. A story that will provoke some reactions. A story told to a bunch of people who probably react to that story in the same kinds of ways we still react to that story. That story is not fair. Okay? That story is not just in North Dallas, that story generally doesn't make people feel satisfied or feel particularly good. In fact, in most any affluent place, this story does not sound like good news. All right? um, but there are other places. Um, our group's going to be going to Guatemala later this week, and they'll be going and working with people in a place like that. Other places where most people are have-nots 
where most people live on the margin, where, where most people, no matter how hard they work, they can't get ahead. They can't climb the ladder because there are no rungs on the ladder. You're just stuck in that place to which you were born. And in those sorts of places where the have-nots live, this story sounds amazing. This story sounds awesome. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. We're going to encounter this story that may be one of the least liked, <laughs> one of the least satisfying parables Jesus told for people like us. Okay? The kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. At 9 o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling him he would pay whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work in the vineyard. At noon, and again at 3 o'clock, he did the same thing. At 5 o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again and saw some more people standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one has hired us. The landowner told them, go and join the others working in my vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers together and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. When those hired at 5 o'clock were paid, they each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner, these people worked only one hour, and yet you have paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. He answered one of them, friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay the last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then and those who are first will be last. And Jesus tells us, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Every time I read that story, I remember something that happened to my family years ago. The kids were very small, and one of the hardest things to do, you young parents can, can, can agree with this, I'm sure one of the hardest things to do when you've got small children is to travel, particularly air travel. Okay? TSA and lines and all this stuff and trying to keep up with the baggage and the stroller and the, the baby, the, you know, the car seat and all that. And the kids. Make sure you don't lose them. It's hard. And on this particular occasion, we were flying out of Oklahoma City. I don't remember where we were going. It wasn't Dallas. It was somewhere that was a little further away. And we, were, we showed up at the airport late. I get stressed out when I travel by air. I get stressed out anyway. When I'm late, I get really stressed out. <laughs> My wife knows this. Well, we were late. We pulled up about 15 minutes before the flight was supposed to leave. Frankly, I didn't think we were going to make it. So we get up there to the counter, and the lady that's helping us is clacking on the keyboard. She's like, you guys are really late. Clack, 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 clack. She said, we've given your seats away. Clack, 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 clack. She said, I'm going to have to put you in first class. I was like... Sounds good to me. <laughs> so we traveled first class. The last were first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we walk on the plane in those nice big seats, and they're serving the drinks and everything. It's good up in the first class part of the plane, man. Life is good up there. And we're sitting by all of these people who pay, and now we're not telling them, obviously, right? But they paid a lot of money for those seats, or they have done a lot of traveling to earn enough air miles to have the status to travel first class, or they redeemed a bunch of miles so they could travel first class, and there we were. There we were. 
And whether this parable, back to the parable, whether this first or last, last or first, whether this parable sounds like good news to you or not depends on whether or not you are used to finishing first. There's an inverse relationship between how you feel about this parable and how entitled you feel as a person, all right? Um, I don't need to tell you that people around here, people like us, we're used to finishing first. We're used to preferential treatment. We're used to, we're used to, well, we, we're not used to, we expect to be acknowledged for the work that we do, admired for the work we do, and rewarded for the work that we do. I remember back in my days as a campus minister at the University of Oklahoma, we were part of one of the churches there in Norman, Oklahoma, and I will never forget something that happened, all right? Um, there was a family there at the church who had been at the church for years. And one of their children's birthday was left out of the birthdays that we put in the bulletin each Sunday. Their child's name and birthday did not appear there. And, you know, we used to run everybody's birthday, the members and the kids and the, their birthdays in the bulletin and everything. And these people were practically founding members of the church. They'd been there a long time. He had been a deacon of the church and all this stuff. Well, this was the second time that one of their kids' birthdays was not in the bulletin. The outrage, the injustice, the suffering that that family endured at the hands of our church staff. Well, I don't know what went wrong. We talked about it, you know, post-game, what, what went on? We, I don't know. We're people. We mess up, and we messed up. Um, I can tell you, we never again ran birthdays in the bulletin. That family left the church over that. Now, the crazy thing is, I like them. They're relatively good people. They're people that look a lot like us and think a lot like us. They don't enjoy being ignored. They don't enjoy not getting what they think they deserve. Um, they were the kind of people that showed up early, that worked late. They felt like they should be valued. They felt like they should have influence, that their opinion should carry weight. They feel like they should get what they're owed. People who are used to being important, who are used to recognition and success, they're people a lot like us, really, honestly. We want what we're owed. We have worked for what we have. We've made contributions. We've put in sweat equity. We've earned what we have. And we tend to think, when we look at this parable, we tend to think like people who are the bosses, not like the workers. So in this parable, you have a boss that is doing things very, very differently, right? Um, the funny thing about this parable, when you hear it, you either think, this is it's really extraordinary, when you hear this parable, you either think this boss is incredibly stingy or extravagantly generous. And how you read that depends on whether you are a person who's gotten used to getting what you deserve. Okay? Stingy? He did pay out exactly what he said he was going to pay out at the beginning of the day. It didn't seem cheap or unfair when the workers agreed to it at the beginning of the day. Generous? Well, I can tell you, those people who only worked one hour thought that guy was incredibly generous. They love that guy. And the whole scene, right, Jesus is telling this story. And the whole thing is, man, he is so sneaky, right? The whole thing is carefully calculated to provoke a reaction. This parable is designed to incite people. The way the payments are doled out. I mean, why do it that way? I'm going to start with the guys who just showed up. 
So the people that got here early in the morning can see exactly what I'm paying them. Then I'll finish with the guys who've been here. I mean, it is a, it is a, a method of paying that's designed to provoke. Um, but if you put your personal feelings aside and you think about this story in terms of the owner's heart, the guy really is incredibly open-handed, really generous. Um, the heart of this guy is so generous, frankly, it's just it's revolutionary. I mean, the way things operate around here for us, um, we tend to think of generosity in a peculiar way. In our culture, generosity is very much tied to merit, right? To what is earned, to what, is, to, to what someone has done for us. You are generous at the restaurant with the tip when that waitress went over and above. Instead of the usual 12, 15%, we're going to give her 20. That's generosity. We're generous at the hotel when the concierge really gave us some good local information and helped us out. Here's a 20 for you, sir. We're really generous in our companies when the employees have worked so hard. It's been a banner year. We're going to be generous and give them bonuses this year. That's how generosity works around here. You've got to, well, you've got to earn it. Generosity in our culture is very much tied to performance, right? Um, then Jesus comes along and tells us this story about the kingdom of heaven, and he introduces us to kingdom generosity. I think it was Mrs. Jones when I was in second grade at Sunday school. She told us grace, G-R-A-C-E. Grace stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. I like that. God's riches because of what Jesus did, not because of what I did, not because of what we earn. And the logic of that is so irrational. I mean, that is not sensible. That's not the way things work, Lord. Um, grace in the Bible, grace is getting what you do not deserve. Grace is getting what you cannot deserve. The greatest reward of all, the most amazing gift that I could receive, the gift of eternal life with God, not based on my performance, not based on my moral goodness, not based on my ability to kind of clean up my life, not based on any amount of good works I've piled up that I can impress God with. Grace is not a tip that God gives me at the end of a well-lived life. Grace is given me because of what Jesus did on the cross. Eternity in heaven. Forgiveness of all of my sins. The gift of the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in my life and help me. All of that is given to me. Just given. Because of the Master's generosity. Three things I want you to think about, and we're going to go through these really quickly on the outline this morning. Just three quick things to think about this week when it comes to this particular parable. I think the first thing it helps us have is a realization. The Lord's generosity is beyond anything we're used to. His grace really is amazing. It is amazing grace, right? It is generosity of a different kind. The second thing, there's a reminder in this parable that the heart of the Christian faith is less about us and more about him. It's less about whether we have worked a lot or a little, whether we've gotten, gotten early and stayed late. Um, it's more about Jesus Christ and his generosity. Now that is revolutionary because the religions of the world are generally based on what you do. Do this, this, and this, and you will get God's favor. That's not Christianity. God's favor comes through what Jesus did. And finally, a response. Will we, as his disciples, surprise the world 
by being generous with the last and the least? Will we do crazy, nutty, surprising, revolutionary things like spend a whole bunch of money to, to get off work and buy a plane ticket and go to Guatemala and give dental care and medicine to people who can't afford it and who could never pay us back? All we're going to get at most is like a gracias out of the deal, okay? Go and build houses and construction projects. Will we do stuff like that? Will we do that here in our mission field of Dallas, Texas? Will we live out this kind of radical kingdom generosity and just blow the world's mind? I think that's the response that this parable calls for from us. It's a parable about workers who spent the whole day laboring out in the vineyard under the Palestinian sun, getting paid the same as those who worked an hour. (laughs) And if that makes sense to you, if grace makes sense to you, if it seems logical, this parable is for you, I think. Kingdom generosity is where the last finish first and the first finish last. When you know that you don't deserve God's grace, when you grasp that the only thing your good deeds and your inherent goodness can earn is judgment and hell, when you get that, you're beginning to grasp the grace of God, that He saved you in spite of everything you've done. In spite of your wickedness, he stepped in and he delivered you and he's bringing you to eternal life with him. When you begin to understand that, you're getting close to the kingdom, right? The most valuable possession anyone could ever hope to hold in their hands given as a gift, no strings attached. It's a gift given to people who can never, ever deserve it or earn it. So what is grace? What does it look like? Just real quickly as we finish up, I want to share with you some words that an author named uh, Sam Storms wrote. He said, The first and possibly most fundamental characteristic of divine grace is that it presupposes sin and guilt. Grace has meaning. Only when men are seen as fallen, unworthy of salvation, and liable to eternal wrath. Grace does not contemplate sinners merely as undeserving, but as ill-deserving. It is not simply that we do not deserve grace. It is that we do deserve hell. So this morning... Have you accepted God's grace, the gift of eternal life offered to you through Jesus Christ? Have you accepted Him as your Lord and Savior? Have you received what God has for you because of what Jesus did for you? You can put Him on in baptism this morning. You can make another step in your discipleship journey today. If that's what you need to do, we'd encourage you to do that. Maybe you just need the prayers of the church this morning. However, you need to respond to God's amazing grace. Do that as we stand together and worship.